Hey everyone, welcome back, and thank you for joining us again in our next discussion of statistics. The first step in summarizing quantitative data is to determine whether the data are discrete or continuous. This is per our conversation in previous sections in case you forgot what the difference is between discrete and continuous data. Now if the data are discrete and there are relatively few different values of the variable, the categories of data, which we call classes, will be the observation values as in qualitative data, meaning nothing has changed. However, if the data are discrete, but there are many different values of the variables, or if the data are continuous, then the categories of data, again the classes, must be created using intervals of numbers. It's these intervals that get a little bit technical. So let's go ahead and jump into our objective where we'll organize discrete data in tables. Jumping into the first example real quick though, we're going to construct frequency and relative frequency distributions from discrete data. Again, our minds need to be in discrete data mode since that's what we're working with. We're told the following data represent the number of available cars in a household based on a random sample of 20 households. Let's construct a frequency and relative frequency distribution of our data. Now they don't tell us that the data is discrete. Instead, we have to recognize if we're talking about the number of available cars in a household, that would be discrete data. It's discrete data because we would count the number of cars in each household as opposed to measuring them so we know we're all set in that aspect. Continuing with the example then, we have a table given to us and laid out with the headings already where we have the number of cars in one column, our frequency, and then our relative frequency in the third column. So the number of cars would represent our categories. And right now we have discrete data and only five categories, which would be zero, one, two, three, or four cars based on our data. Looking at the data, the smallest value that we have would be zero, the largest value we have would be four, so that's why we're gonna treat it as discrete data instead of making classes. For the frequency, we are literally just adding up how many times we see zero in our data, meaning we see three zeros, therefore the frequency would be three because that's how many households have zero cars. Following that same logic, it looks like we have five ones, which means five households have one car. Finishing out our chart, it looks like we have nine households with two cars, one household with three cars, and two households with four cars. Adding up those frequencies, we have a total of 20 households, which is what they told us in our sample size, which means we know we didn't miss any of the data. Next, we need to do a relative frequency distribution. Remember to find the relative frequency. We take the frequency of each category and we divide it by the total. So to find the relative frequency of our category of zero cars, we have three divided by 20, and that gives us a relative frequency of 0.15. Similarly, for the category of one car in a household, we've got five over 20, which gives us a relative frequency of a 0.25. Finishing out the rest of our distribution, we have a 0 0.45, 0 0.05, and a 0 0.10, as you see, which means we're all set on the construction of our frequency and relative frequency distributions. Now, just as a side note, remember on an exam, you would not be given this table to guide you along the way. Instead, you'd be given just the question, and you'd have to construct the table on the blank page. Continuing to our next objective then, we need to know how to construct histograms of discrete data. Well first, a histogram would be a graph constructed by drawing rectangles for each class of data. We need to know that the height of each rectangle is the frequency or relative frequency of the class, similar to a bar graph. The width of each rectangle is the same, but unlike our bar graph of qualitative data, the rectangles touch each other. This is because we're working with quantitative data we want to show the data flow as it increases or decreases a little bit more smoothly than we do with bar graphs where we're separating categories. And the last point is a big one for us. This is the one that's easy to forget. The label of the explanatory variable is on the horizontal axis like we've seen before, but right now it needs to be under the center of our category. This is because we're working with discrete data. This last point is gonna change when we switch over to continuous data and it is the most technical side of these particular graphs. We'll illustrate, of course, with our example. Heading into our example then, we're asked to draw a frequency and relative frequency histogram for the number of cars per household data that we did in the previous example. So we have our frequency and our relative frequencies already. We have our categories that are number of cars. Let's go ahead and jump into the frequency histogram first. Now again, on an exam, we'd have just a blank area here, similar to what we have, just organizing a little bit with this box. So the first thing we wanna do is label our axes, because that's the easiest thing to forget. 
Remember, we're doing a frequency histogram, so the frequencies will go on the vertical axis. And in this example, the number of cars we're discussing, the categories that we have, would be on the horizontal axis. Next, let's go ahead and label our axes with the values that we have for each of them. I'm going to label the vertical axis with 2 through 10 here. What we care about is that the intervals are equal. So it's okay to go 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 10 if you want. What we care about, though, is that we are consistent with our labeling. Thus, you see each interval of 2. On the horizontal axis, I've got 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 for each of those categories for the number of cars per household. From there, we're drawing our vertical bars just like you did with bar graphs. But now with a histogram, remember these vertical bars are going to touch. Constructing my first bar then, in the category of 0 cars, we have a frequency of 3, as seen in our table. So you see the height of the bar is about 3. Remember, we don't need to worry too much about being perfect here. This is just a hand-drawn graph, so you're giving us a best sketch. In our next category of one car in a household, we had five households that said that. Therefore, our next bar has a height of five, and we just keep going down the line for each category then. Finishing up our graph, we have the bars for two, three, and four, those categories of cars per household, and we have our frequency histogram. Now, as a little side note, some instructors will say it's okay to go ahead and label the frequencies within the bar. It's not a technical aspect. It's just to make sure you, as a student in a classroom setting, feel a little bit more comfortable. That is, if you prefer and your instructor approves it, then sometimes it's fine to say our frequencies within that bar like so, just to show the instructor specifically what those frequencies were instead of having to read them based on their height. So now let's jump over to the relative frequency histogram. Just like we did with the frequency histogram, we need to remember each detail here. So the first thing I'm going to do is label my vertical axis. This time it's relative frequency. Fine with me if you label that like so. Remember, relative frequencies would be our proportions for each category. But on the horizontal axis, we still have the number of cars in each household as our category. So that doesn't change. The values of our vertical axis now are representing the proportions, like we said. Therefore, instead of our 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10 with the frequencies, now I've separated as a 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 3, 4, and 5, representing the relative frequency of each of those categories. The horizontal axis hasn't changed in its values either because it's still the categories, which would be our number of cars per household. And that means we just start constructing our bars just like we did with the frequency histogram. The first bar in the category of 0 has a relative frequency of a 0 0.15, which we get from our relative frequency distribution. In the category of 1 car in a household, we have a relative frequency of a 0 0.25, and you see our second bar at a height of a 0 0.25. Continuing in that fashion, just like you did with your frequency histogram, we finish up our graph with the remaining bars, again focusing on the idea that the bars are touching each other because it is a histogram, and we're all set with our relative frequency histogram. One more thing to highlight real quick though, as discussed with that last bullet point of a histogram, since we're working with discrete values, notice that our values on the horizontal axis are under the center of each bar. That's what we emphasized previously, and this will change when we switch over to continuous data. Heading into our next objective then, we need to know how to organize continuous data in tables. This introduces again that idea of classes. Classes are categories into which data are grouped into intervals. We use these when a data set consists of either a large number of discrete data values or continuous data. So if we have continuous data, we're going to use intervals but we'll also use intervals if we have a large number of different discrete data values, meaning a lot of different categories, so we don't want to handle them individually. Sometimes that can be a bit confusing, but it's usually discussed in the problem anyway. We will elaborate, of course, as we roll through examples. In order to establish classes, we need to know what a lower class limit is. This would be the smallest value within the class. The upper class limit would be the largest data value in the class, of course, but the concept that causes the most confusion would be the class width. This would be the difference between consecutive lower class limits. People tend to accidentally subtract the upper limit by the lower limit, and that will throw off our class width along with sequential classes. Instead, we're going to be told to set a class width of some number. Therefore, if that's the case, we have to remember what that class width means. So here's a quick example to elaborate on that concept. We're given the following data representing the number of persons aged 25 through 64 who are currently working disabled. We see our classes based on the age. So the first class that we see would be from ages 25 to 34. And then we have the frequency of each category given. Now note, this is still discrete data. 
We're discussing some number of persons in this example, so we're working with discrete data because we would count how many people fall into each category. However, since we have so many categories, meaning from 25 up to 64, we don't want to handle each category individually. That would be a lot of categories if we did 25, 26, 27, etc. Therefore, since we have so many discrete categories, we've organized them into classes. Heading down to the questions then, the lower class limit of the first class in the data given above is, we'll make sure we're careful to recognize that the first class would be age 25 to 34, and that means the lower class limit of that would be age 25. Continuing, the upper class limit of the first class still in the data above would be 34. It is the highest value in that class, making sure we're careful not to think that we're discussing 64. That would be the upper class limit of the last class or the uppermost class. Instead, we're still discussing the first class, so we've got an upper class limit of 34. Next, we need to find the class width of the data given above. Remember to find the class width, we need to find the difference between consecutive lower class limits. Therefore, we're finding the difference between 35 and 25, and of course, that gives us a result of 10. Again, make sure we are quite careful on this one. This is the one that people tend to forget or confuse. The most common mistake we see is to do 34 minus 25 because that would be within one class, but that is not the class width. Just to repeat, the class width would be the difference between lower class limits of consecutive classes. And we have our class width. Continuing then, we need to know how to construct a continuous data frequency and relative frequency distribution table. But before we go into detail, note that the problem typically provides both of these details just to minimize some stress. This is approached in a real life research situation as opposed to a classroom situation where we're working on problems. So our first step would be to choose the lower class limit of the first class. That means we want to choose the smallest observation in the data set or in real life, we would choose a convenient number slightly lower than the smallest observation in the data set. That is, for example, if the smallest observation is 17, we don't really want to work with 17 as a lower class limit. That's a bit inconvenient of a number. Instead, we choose the lower class limit of the first class to be 15 so that our classes end up a little more convenient to work with, or the lower class limits go 15, 25, 35, etc. Then we want to determine the class width, and that usually means we want to choose a convenient class width to work with as well, such as 5, 10, or some multiple of 10. Class width is usually determined by how many classes we want to create. Again, typically the problem provides both of these details for us anyway, so we should be all set. 